and, and Marlene were sharing just their testimonies. You know, I was thinking just maybe yesterday about the word, you know, we've just declared that word for years now that Brother Hagen gave several years ago. Gifts of healings are going to fall like showers of rain. And one man that we listen to likes to say, that prophetic word has met its moment. And I just kept feeling like that yesterday. It's time. It's time for gifts of healings to fall like showers of rain. People that have contended, people that have held on to promises, people that have just fought and fought and fought for their healing, fought for you know, promises of God, it's time. It's time for those things to come forth. It's time for healings to manifest in bodies. You know, we've gone through one of the biggest storms we've gone through this past year. My husband was diagnosed with cancer, I guess last maybe September, October. And he said the Lord spoke to him before we found I think it was before he ever found out it was cancer. He was seeking the Lord because he was really sick. The Lord said, I want you to ride out the storm. And we're riding out the storm into victory. Steve has three more treatments left. They've taken him off of a couple of the chemotherapy drugs. So he's just going to have one drug that he has to finish these next three treatments and has less side effects. But God is bringing us forth into victory. We've come, we cross to the other side, and God has given us victory. And so we're just believing God for a greater healing anointing to see people healed of cancer, to see people healed of uh, terminal diseases, whatever it is, God's healing and God's restoring and people that have contended for promises. We're getting ready to see the manifestation of those things. Amen. Those prophetic words have met their moment. It's time for them to come forth and manifest totally and completely. So I just want to share something that is just burning inside of me, burning in my heart. The last couple of years, uh, the Lord has just had us, you know, of course, because of COVID, most of us were stuck in our homes for a lot of time and more time than we usually spend in our homes and stuff. And just, we spent a lot of time praying our, you know, we've always focused, um, our church has always, just about always had times of prayer. We never have a service that we don't have. We set aside time where we're making declarations and decrees you know, the Lord said, my house will be a house of prayer. One scripture says for all nations, for all people, my house will be a house of prayer. And so, you know, we've been called to pray and we've been called as the ecclesia. So I want to start, I want to just talk some about the ecclesia. So let's just read um, Matthew 16. Uh, starting with verse 13, says, When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question, What are the people saying about me, the Son of Man? Who do they believe I am? They answered, Some are convinced that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah, reincarnate, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked. And Simon Peter spoke up and said, You are the anointed one the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are favored and privileged, Simon, son of Jonah, for you didn't discover this on your own, but my father in heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. I give you the name Peter, a stone, and this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation on which I will build my church, my legislative assembly, and the power of death, or the gates of hell, most translations say, will not be able to overpower it. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven, to release on earth that which is released in heaven. 
And so we've been, Jesus said, these are the words of Jesus, I will build my ecclesia. You know, I think about every place in the King James Version that says church means ecclesia. And we've just taken it more as a building, as a group of people that meet together in one place. And, you know, we just come together and we do praise and worship. We have a sermon, which is good. We need those things. And, but we never legislate. We hardly ever legislate for him. We, he's called us to be a governing body for his kingdom. And he said, I'm building my church. And I don't think he built it back then. And it's, it's fin it was finished then. He's still building his ecclesia. And so, like I was saying, in King James, it always says church. Because when the Bible was being, uh, the King James Version was being written, King James did not like the word ecclesia. He's like, you have to come up with a different word. And so finally they come up with church and he was satisfied with that. And so a lot of times we've just looked at that as, a, you know, a, or maybe even as the whole, the whole church. You know, every Christian person is, of course, part of the body of Christ. And we've looked at that as the church, but he's called us to be a legislative assembly, a body of believers that come together to govern for the king and his kingdom. Amen. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we're here to govern for the king and for his kingdom to see his kingdom established upon the earth today, to see his will being done in the earth today and in the nations of the earth. And so we are called to govern for him, to be a, a legislative, to allow what needs to be allowed, to, to forbid what needs to be forbidden. And there's a lot of things that have been allowed because we haven't been what we've been called to be. You know, all the things that are happening right now, these happened on our watch and we've kind of dropped the ball and haven't been, but thank God he's teaching us, amen? He's teaching us how to be that legislative body. He's given that revelation. I believe it's really coming forth right now. That's one of the things that we've just been praying and declaring and decreeing, Lord, let your ecclesia arise in the earth today, your governing body to govern for the king and his kingdom, to, to see on earth what the Father wants done on the earth. You know, throughout the word of God, it talks about having ears to hear. There was times when the people didn't want to hear what the spirit of the Lord was saying. And they closed their ears and God said he closed their ears because they didn't want to hear. And so that's another one of our prayers. Lord, we want those ears that hear. I want to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the church today. I want to know what he's saying. Jesus said, I don't say anything except what I hear my father say. I don't do anything except what I see my father do. And we're the body of Christ in the earth today. And so we need to function like he functioned here on the earth. He's still the head. We're the body. And so we want to operate and function like he did. We want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We want to begin to declare and decree those things. Like I was saying earlier about Brother Hagin. I mean, that was years ago that he gave that prophetic word, gifts of healings. It was like he was seeing it, gifts of healing. I see gifts of healings falling like showers of rain. Well, we still haven't seen that. I think we're beginning to see that happen. But I think it's just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And we're going to see uh, those things. I mean, they had the healing revival, you know, in the 50s. And lots of healings taking place. Brother Hagen talked a lot about that and how 
easy it was at that time to get people healed. And then, you know, we had the Jesus movement and they talk like it was the easiest. I mean, I got saved as a child during that time. I didn't have a clue that there was a Jesus movement going on or anything, you know, going on like that. But it, it was just like, no matter what, there was just such an opportunity for people to get saved. And I've heard some say, all you had to say was peanut butter and people would get saved. You know, it was just the easiest thing in the world to get people saved. And so, you know, with a billion soul harvest or more coming into the kingdom of God, we're going to have that time too, where people are just going to be drawn. You know, it's something we prayed, you know, except the spirit draw them. And we've just been praying, Holy Spirit, draw the people and so I believe we are coming into that time where we're going to see the we're beginning to see that also the billion soul harvest come in and I don't know if Jesus is going to be satisfied with a billion soul I keep saying that Jesus give us two billion let us have more than than what has even been declared because we want him to be satisfied with the travail of his soul. We want him to be satisfied with this harvest that's going to be reaped. And so we want to be the governing body on the earth today. We've called to, go, been, you know, to govern for him. And just one of the notes in the Passion, it says the Greek word for church is ecclesia and means a legislative assembly or selected ones. This is not a religious term at all, but a political and governmental term that is used many times in classical Greek for a group of people who have been summoned and gathered together to govern the affairs of a city. For Jesus to use this term means he has given the keys of governmental authority to his, uh, in his kingdom to the church. So we've been given those keys the keys of the kingdom, which represents the authority of the kingdom. And, you know, uh, I was listening to someone and they, I can't remember, it was a dream, a vision, or just a reality where an angel appeared to him and had a set of keys. And he said the keys were huge. And he was, you know, thinking, how can I use these keys? And the angel told him, he said, these keys are voice activated. We have to declare what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. And that's one of the ways that we use the kingdom or the keys of the kingdom. We speak things. We declare things. And, you know, as the uh, a legislative assembly, as the ecclesia, that's one way we govern. You know, we forbid. We, you know, we can hear things. Uh, that's happening and, and just start saying, no, we're not going to allow that. We're not going to have that. And, you know, the Lord has had us, I told Cindy and, and Sarah and Kathy the other night when we were doing our prayer thing, you know, I felt like the, over the years, we have probably prayed for nations, asking the Lord for nations, because the Father asked Jesus, said, Ask me of the nations, and I will do it. I will give them to you as your inheritance. And so, uh, you know, I just keep telling the Lord, you, you told Jesus, when we get the same inheritance that Jesus gets, and you said to ask, you told Jesus to ask for the nations, and you would do it. Lord, you said you would do it if he would ask, and I believe Jesus asked, and then we get to ask with him. We get to ask for the nations because it's our inheritance too. We get the same inheritance. We're joint heirs with him. And so we get the same inheritance. So over the years, we have prayed a lot for nations, asking the Lord for nations, praying for the nations that um, especially my husband has gone into and just asking for nations and wanting to see Jesus get his full reward and, and what he's asked for. Well, especially these last two, three, four years, the Lord has really had us focused on America. 
and just praying for, I've never prayed for America this much in my entire life as we've prayed the last three or four years. Uh, and one of the things that our one man uh, shared how the Lord told him, he said, I have to have America for this next harvest. I have to have America for this great awakening. And in the natural, it looks like America's going backwards instead of forwards. It looks like, but God is turning things around in America because there is an ecclesia that's rising up and saying, no, we're not going to allow the left to disciple this nation anymore. And that's the thing. The great part of the Great Commission is to disciple nations. And I thought I knew what that was, but I, I've come to realize I don't, I didn't have a clue of what that really meant. And I think the Lord is giving, even just releasing greater revelation now. And we've allowed the wrong people to disciple this nation. And we can see where it's taking us as a nation. And, you know, we have mountains of society that are being governed by the wrong people. And thank God that an ecclesy is rising up and we're saying we're going to take back the mountains of society. We can see our government, the wickedness in our government right now. Well, we've dropped the ball and not taken our place as the ecclesia to rule and reign in these uh, mountains of society. You know, it's talking about Sarah being a teacher, or maybe others of you, uh, you know, are on different mountains of society and just those mountains or government, education, um, arts and entertainment, media, family, religion, and financial. And, you know, the Lord has called people and a anointed them, ordained for them to be in these mountains of society that, you know, has affects the way a nation goes. And so the Lord is raising up the righteous right now, speaking to people that he's never spoken to before, saying, this is where I want you to be. I want you to run for office. I want you to be on the school board. I want you to be because we're taking back these mountains of society. And so we're just believing that the Lord's really giving these people that he's anointed, that he's speaking to, that he's giving them a favor, that he's given them a voice, that he's given them influence. He's going to give them greater influence in these mountains and and going in as the ecclesia on these mountains and saying, no, we're not going to have that. I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm not going to give in to a woke, the wokeness that's, you know, taking place in our nation right now. And, you know, sadly, even, which it's the mountain of religion, it's not just talking about Christianity, but uh, the ecclesia has to arise and say, you know, we're not going to back down. We're not going to back down as the church. We're not going to quit being a voice of righteousness and justice. We're not going to quit being a voice for truth. We're going to speak the truth from the pulpits of America and take back the church and take back the influence of the church. I mean, there was times when the church had great influence. You know, I think of a man, John Knox, that uh, was in Scotland, and his prayer, continual prayer was, Lord, give me Scotland unless I die. And he prayed for Scotland and prayed and prayed. And the, the queen, I can't remember, the queen of England at that time or what, she said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies of Europe. And maybe it's Queen of Scotland. She was saying, you know, I fear the prayers of this one man. And what would a, a group, a body of believers that were, you know, we can have influence. I think we can get to that place where people are going to fear the prayers of the ecclesia today. 
because they're going to see the kingdom of God come and the will of God be done and see a people that won't back down, but are going to take back the mountains of society and aren't going to be asleep any longer. You know, that's one of the prayers we pray, Lord, you know, we want this awakening. We pray, have been crying out for an awakening. Uh, my idea of an awakening was uh, revival, was uh, salvations, was the healings and just things like that. And I've realized uh, an awakening, we've got to wake up. The church has been asleep and we've got to wake up. We've got to wake up to reality. We've got to wake up to what's really happening around us, what's really happening in our nation. And so, you know, we've been praying for that awakening and God woke us up. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to be woke up. I thought I was awake and I was not awake. Uh, we were having a prayer meeting down at the church and uh, before we started praying, we were uh, just having a time of praise and worship and and as soon as my husband was done with the praise and worship he turned to me and he's like start praying and see my it just started rising up out of me wake up wake up wake up church wake up well I didn't know it until after the service he started telling me he's like he's playing the guitar, leading worship. And he said there was like two or three times when it was like, I feel like I just woke up. <laughs> and he said, how can I feel like that? I'm standing here singing and playing the guitar. And it happened like three times where he was just like jolted awake. And then the first thing that comes out of my mouth is wake up, wake up. And just praying for the church to wake up, for the alarm to be sounded in Zion. And the church has to get awakened. To We have to be awake. If we want the world to be awake, if we want society to be awake, and thank God that there's people in our nation uh, that are being awakened. It's not just the church, but patriots are being awakened in our nation and people that are, you know, rising up and being a voice for what's right and what's true in our nation. And so, you know, again, we want to come together as the ecclesia to rule and reign for the king and his kingdom, to use the keys that he's given unto us. He's given us that authority. He's given us the kings, keys of the kingdom. And like I said, if their voice activated, then we got to use our voice, declaring the word of God, declaring what God has said, whether through the word or through a prophetic word, through what he's spoken to us just individually or as, you know, a church and whatever it is, we want to be declaring those things. And taking back what belongs to us, taking back a nation, whether it's America, whether it's Vietnam, Thailand, wherever we're at, God wants uh, to awaken nations. He wants to touch nations. That's his heart. Why did he make that declaration to Jesus? Ask of me and I will do it. I'll give you the nations. As your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth is your possessions, because that's the heart of God. Of course, nations that represents people, people groups, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. That's the heart of God. He loves people. And so he wants to see people influenced and people's hearts touched. But it's going to take the ecclesia coming and being who we've been called to be. You know, the I know I've shared this with Cindy before, but it's been a while back, a few years, and we were just in a meeting during, I think, praise and worship. I can't remember if it was a time of prayer, maybe, and all of a sudden, it was like the Holy Spirit started saying, I've kept you under the radar, and I kept hearing this stealth. I've kept you 
under the radar. And it was like I kept, you know, seeing us going in with our prayers and as a stealth bomber and annihilating the plans of the enemy. You know, we don't have to have a big show. We don't have to, you know, do all these things a lot of time. God wants to keep us under the radar where we go in. And a lot of times you find out, oh, there's other people going in at the same time <laughs> and been praying the same prayers and going in to annihilate the plans, the purposes, the schemes of the enemy. And, you know, he has, God has a purpose. He has a plan. And we're believing for his plan to come forth. But the enemy has a plan. He has purpose. He has schemes. And we're to, to see his schemes, his plans totally and completely blown up, totally and completely annihilated by the power of our God. And so God wants us to, uh, to do that. A lot of times, you know, we feel like we have to have a lot of people to be able to do a whole lot. But he said, we're two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst. I think it's the Amplified says, representing me. And so when we come together, we want to represent him. We want to represent him. We want to pray what heaven is declaring. We want to, you know, hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying into the church. And we begin to declare that. We begin to say that. And, uh, you know, there is a difference. God has called us as kings and priests unto our God. And priests, we minister to the people. We uh, maybe are a go-between between God and the people. But he's called us to be kings also. Kings declare. Kings make decrees. And when they make a decree, that is how it is. And so we want to hear, what does the Lord want to decree? And we come into agreement, alignment with what he's saying. And we begin to make those decrees. And we don't back down from it. No matter how long it's going to take, we just keep decreeing and declaring that. And so that's one of the things, you know, with our nation, we keep declaring. We keep decreeing what God has said about America. And, you know, just even our founding fathers, began to de make declarations, coming into covenant with a covenant-keeping God who keeps covenant for a thousand generations. You know, that's one of the things, one of the reasons I believe that we're, we're coming back into covenant with God as America because our founding fathers made covenant with God. And he said, uh, one of the first, I believe, pastors I think Hunt maybe was his name. And he began to declare, from the shores of this nation, labors will be thrust forth into every, not only throughout this land, but the nations of the earth. We will be a light, a city sat on a hill for all the world to see. And just begin to make those declarations. That's the reason this nation was raised up by God uh, to be a nation, one nation under one God to serve God with a liberty and a freedom, uh, to serve him in spirit and in truth. And, you know, that was the driving force of pilgrims coming to this land. Many knew that they would lose their lives or family members. And, you know, I read just a little bit about um, Columbus and just the drive he had. It's like, I have to get to this land. And there was just a drive inside of him that just something that just drove him to that. And I was just shocked at how it was like this driving force on the inside of him. I've got to get to this land. And God put that on the inside of him. God wants to put things on the inside of us that drive us to do what he wants done in the earth today and so we want to to hear what heaven is saying we want to see what heaven is doing and you know one of the things that uh, we begin to 
just to, we've been praying just the unction of the Holy Spirit in um, Jeremiah 20, verse 11. It says, but the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. And, you know, we've been made in the image of God. And a lot of times we see God sometimes differently than the way he is. And but this uh, scripture in Jeremiah, but the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. And just that uh, mighty, terrible one means it's a Gabor. And Gabors love the battle. They go after the battle. You know, we have, we have scriptures in the word of God talking about David and his mighty men. Those They loved the battle. David, you know, even made the statement, you know, he's, He's, I, I want the battles of the Lord. He didn't just pick his battles and say, oh, I think I'll do this. And he sought the Lord concerning what he was to do. He's like, I have to fight the battles of the Lord. And, you know, we can a lot of times take on a battle that's not ours. And God wants us to battle for him. And, you know, we're made in his image. And let me see this. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, again, there's that government, shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, this mighty God in this scripture is El Gabor. He's the mighty warrior. He's the mighty God. And uh, El Gabor is a picture of God as a warrior and a champion. Gabor in the Strongs means powerful, strong, and mighty. And wherever the Bible speaks of mighty men of valor or men of power like David, Jephthah, Joshua, Nimrod, who were all renowned for their strength and skill as warriors, uh, the same word is used as Gabor. And then God, you know, we're called David's mighty men. They were Gabors. We have God as El Gabor. We've been created in his image. And I believe that's one of the things. The Lord raise up the Gabors today. God is calling us to be his mighty men today, to be his Gabors, to run to the battle, to fight for our nations, to fight the fight, the, the Lord's fight, to fight in the Lord's battle. And there's a battle over nations right now. There's a battle over this harvest. You know, I thought, you know, we just kept declaring there's going to be a billion so harvest. There's going to be a a billion, a two billion, a soul harvest in the earth. And I thought, you know, the prophets have prophesied it. And we just come in, into alignment, into agreement with that. And it seemed like after we got in the battle of this, I thought, how did we think we were really going to reap a billion, two billion soul harvest without a battle? There's a battle over the souls of the nations. There's a battle over the soul of this nation. There's a battle over the souls of men and women, over this harvest that's going to be reaped. And we, Jesus will get his harvest. We're going to see this harvest reaped in the nations of the earth. I just thought us declaring it, decreeing it, believing it, that it was just going to happen. Well, we have an enemy. He's a defeated enemy, and he's not going to win. But we have an enemy that's trying to fight to keep us out of the promises of God, to keep us out of what God has for us. But God is raising up fierce warriors today. He's raising up the Gabors. And I want to be a Gabor. I want to run to the battle. 
you know, a lot of us, and I've felt that a lot, especially this past year with my husband going through all of this uh, as major, major surgery, coming to death's door, and just, you know, I've felt the weariness. And that's one of the tactics of the enemy is to wear out the saints, to wear us out, to keep us battle weary. And God is wanting to put on the inside of us a, a warrior spirit, a mighty warrior. And just some of the definitions of just the Gabor, awe-inspiring, terror-striking, awesome, terrifying, ruthless, mighty warrior against the powers of darkness. He wants us to be those strong, mighty warriors for him. We've been made in his image, and he is a mighty God. He is the mighty God. He's El Gabor, and he's fighting for his people. We're not in this alone. There's been angels that have never been loosed on the earth today, that are loosed on the earth to fight in this battle with us. We're not in this alone. You know, just as Elijah's servant, Elijah declared to us, there's more with us than there are with them. And there's even more with us today than there was even then. So we can definitely say that there's more with us than there are with them. And so El Gabor, has created us in his image. Amen. And we are called to be Gabors. I know not everybody's going to be a Gabor, but there are women. I don't think it's just men that he's calling to be Gabors. I mean, I look at Cindy and the fight that she's taken on for her family, for nations. And I look at her as a Gabor. And God's calling us to be those Gabors, to be those mighty warriors for him. And just uh, Isaiah 42, 13 says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall, shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Mighty man. He's a Gabor, and our God is El Gabor. He's the mighty God, and he's mighty to save. He's mighty to deliver. He's mighty to set free, and he's called us to fight with him, and we're fighting for his causes. And, you know, David made that declaration. Is there not a cause? And seem like there's so many, uh, you know, saying the wrong things and saying, you know, we don't need to be praying for America like this, that America's doomed, America's gone too far. No, we serve a God of mercy and his mercy triumphs over judgment. But he has a plan and he has a purpose for this nation and your nation. Amen. God has a plan and a purpose for America. And I found myself praying at times, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause to fight? There's a cause, amen, because God raised this nation up for a purpose and for a reason to be that beachhead for the gospel going forth throughout the nations of the earth, to be a voice for him, to be a light for him, to be a city sat on a hill. He called us as a Christian nation, and I just keep declaring we are a Christian nation. We're one nation under one God, the one true and living God. We're not going to back down from that. And I believe we're going to be known again as a Christian nation, not in name only, but because that's truly who we are, a Christian nation. Amen. One nation under one God, the one true and living God. This is a scripture that we have just prayed and declared and and. Psalms 24 just made declarations about this. Psalms 24, verse 8. Here, let's start with 7. 
So wake up, you living, this is passion again. So wake up, you living gateways. Lift up your head, you ageless doors of destiny. Welcome the king of glory, for he is about to come through you. You ask, who is this king, glory king? The Lord armed and ready for battle. The mighty one. El Gabor, that's who is fighting for our nation, fighting for us. You ask, who is this glory king? The Lord, Lord armed and ready for battle. The mighty one, invincible in every way. So wake up, you living gateways, and rejoice. Fling wide, you ageless doors of destiny. Here he comes, the king of glory. He is ready to come in. You ask, who is this king of glory? He is the Lord of victory, armed and ready for battle. The mighty one, the invincible commander of heaven's host. Yes, he is the king of glory. He's a mighty God. He's a mighty warrior. He's the king of glory, and he is coming in. He's coming into our nation. He's coming in, and he's taking over because the ecclesia is risen up and is allowing him to come in. We are the ones that bring him into this nation. He's fighting. He's fighting for us. He's fighting with us. He's, a, he's El Gabor. He's a, he's a fierce warrior. And he's called us to be Gabors. He's called us to be mighty warriors for him. And so we want to rule and reign for the king and his kingdom. And we're going to do it. We're going to see his kingdom come. We're going to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to see his plans and his purposes come forth because we're fighting. Amen. The battles of the Lord. We're not fighting our own battles, but we're fighting the battles of the Lord. And so we want to, to do that as the ecclesia. Amen. As his body of believers in the earth today that he's given the keys of the kingdom to. And we're going to open doors. He's going to open doors through us that no one can shut. He's going to lock, lock doors, shut doors that no one can open. And he ch has chosen to work through people, to work through his ecclesia. And so he has a, an ecclesia that has arisen in the earth today that is armed and ready for battle, that are declaring what heaven is declaring, that are uh, not backing down, that are just God is putting on the inside of us such a, a that warrior spirit, just that I'm not giving in. I'm not backing down. I'm throwing off weariness. He doesn't want us to be weary and well-doing. For in due season, we're going to reap because we haven't fainted. We're going to reap a harvest of souls. We're going to reap and see this nation discipled the way that he wants it discipled by people that have stood for righteousness and justice and truth. And we're going to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've declared that over and over and over. You know, one of the things that he uh, made promise to Abraham, your seed will possess the gates of the enemy. That's one of the things that I declare, our seed's going to possess the gates of the enemy. And we know Jesus, amen, is going to possess the gates of the enemy. But like I said earlier, we're heirs of God and join heirs with Jesus. So we get to partner with heaven. We get to partner with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and seeing his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just as we were having our prayer meeting, uh, Cindy began to pray out some things and she just started saying, um, demonstration, demonstration. She's like, I don't know what that means, but I keep hearing demonstrations. And before we were done, she was asking me, you know, what we wanted, if there was anything else I wanted to do for today. And I said, well, you said demonstration, so I think we need to demonstrate. 
And so we're going to take some time to pray. Is there anything, Cindy, you want to add, you want to do before we start praying? Um, <clears throat> Rita? Yes? This sound like Sunday? Mighty warrior? Yes, brother, does it? Yep. Mighty men. <laughs> Mighty men of valor. And women of valor. And women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Taking your place. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, that was the only thing that I wanted to just, I wanted to recognize what God had done Sunday, what he was saying Sunday in, in their church. And it goes right along with being that mighty warrior. Confirmation. Amen. Amen. Okay, Pam, no, you just go ahead and lead us out. Okay. And send it you or any of the team that wants to jump in. And okay. Holy Spirit gives y'all something, just feel free to jump in and, and share. Okay. So uh, 